Therese. Chapter 6. Uncle Alec's Room. Soon after dinner, and before she had got acquainted with half her new possessions, Dr. Alec proposed a drive to carry round the first installment of gifts to the aunts and cousins. Rose was quite ready to go, being anxious to try a certain soft burnous from the box, which not only possessed a most engaging little hood, but had funny tassels bobbing in all directions. The big carriage was full of parcels, and even Ben's seat was loaded with Indian war clubs, a Chinese kite of immense size, and a pair of polished ox horns from Africa. Uncle Alec, very blue as to his clothes, and very brown as to his face, sat bolt upright, surveying well-known places with interest, while Rose, feeling unusually elegant, leaned back folded in her soft mantle, and played she was an eastern princess, making a royal progress among her subjects. At three of the places their calls were brief, for Aunt Myra's guitar was unusually bad. Aunt Clara had a room full of company, and Aunt Jane showed such a tendency to discuss the population, productions, and politics of Europe, Asia, and Africa, that even Dr. Alec was dismayed, and got away as soon as possible. "'Now we will have a good time. I do hope the boys will be at home,' said Rose with a sigh of relief, as they wound yet higher up the hill to Aunt Jessie's. "'I left this for the last call, so that we might find the lads just in from school.' Yes, there's Jamie on the gate, watching for us. Now you'll see the clan gather. They are always swarming about together. The instant Jamie saw the approaching guests, he gave a shrill whistle, which was answered by echoes from meadow, house, and barn, as the cousins came running from all directions, shouting, Hooray for Uncle Alec! They went at the carriage like highwaymen, robbed it of every parcel, took the occupants prisoners, and marched them into the house with great exultation. "'Little Mum! Little Mum! Here they are with lots of goodies! Come down and see the fun right away! Quick!' bawled Will and Jordy amidst a general ripping off of papers that soon turned the tidy room into chaos. Down came Aunt Jessie with a pretty cap half on, but such a beaming face below it that one rather thought the flyaway headgear an improvement. She had hardly time to greet Rose and the doctor before the boys were about her, each clamoring for her to see his gift and rejoicing over it with him, for little Mom went halves in everything. The great horn skirmished about her as if to toss her to the ceiling. The war clubs hurtled over her head as if to annihilate her. An amazing medley from the four quarters of the globe filled her lap, and seven excited boys all talked to her at once. But she liked it. Oh, dear, yes, and she sat smiling, admiring, and explaining, quite untroubled by the din, which made Rose cover up her ears, and Dr. Alec threaten instant flight if the riot was not quelled. That threat produced a lull, and while the uncle received thanks in one corner, the aunt had some little confidences made to her in the other. Well, dear, and how are things going with you now? Better, I hope, than they were a week ago. "'Aunt Jessie, I think I'm going to be very happy, now that Uncle has come. "'He does the queerest things, but he is so good to me, I can't help loving him.' "'Nestling closer to little Mum, Rose told all that had happened, "'ending with a rapturous account of the splendid box. "'I am very glad, dear, but, Rose, I must warn you of one thing. "'Don't let Uncle spoil you.' "'But I like to be spoiled, Auntie. "'I don't doubt it, but if you turn out badly when the year is over, "'he will be blamed and his experiment proved a failure. "'That would be a pity, wouldn't it, when he wants to do so much for you, "'and can do it if his kind heart does not get in the way of his good judgment.' "'I never thought of that, and I'll try not to be spoiled, "'but how can I help it?' asked Rose anxiously. "'by not complaining of the wholesome things he wants you to do, "'by giving him cheerful obedience as well as love, "'and even making some small sacrifices for his sake. "'I will, I truly will, "'and when I get in a worry about things, may I come to you? "'Uncle told me to, and I feel as if I shouldn't be afraid. "'You may, darling. "'This is the place where little troubles are best cured, 
And this is what mothers are for, I fancy. And Aunt Jessie drew the curly head to her shoulder with a tender look that proved how well she knew what medicine the child most needed. It was so sweet and comfortable that Rose sat still enjoying it till a little voice said, Mama, don't you think Pokey would like some of my shells? Rose gave Phoebe some of her nice things, and it was very good of her. Can I? Who is Pokey? asked Rose, popping up her head, attracted by the odd name. My dolly, do you want to see her? asked Jamie, who had been much impressed by the tale of adoption he overheard. Yes, I'm fond of dollies. Only don't tell the boys, or they will laugh at me. They don't laugh at me, and they play with my dolly a great deal, but she likes me best. And Jamie ran away to produce his pet. I brought my old doll, but I keep her hidden because I am too big to play with her, and yet I can't bear to throw her away. I'm so fond of her, said Rose, continuing her confidences in the whisper. You can come and play with Jamie's whenever you like, for we believe in dollies up here began Aunt Jessie, smiling to herself, as if something amused her. Just then Jamie came back, and Rose understood the smile, for his dolly proved to be a pretty four-year-old girl, who trotted in as fast as her fat little legs would carry her. Making straight for the shells, she scrambled up an armful, saying with a laugh that showed her little white teeth, "'All for Jamie and me, for Jamie and me!' "'That's my dolly!' "'Isn't she a nice one?' asked Jamie proudly, surveying his pet, with his hands behind him and his short legs rather far apart, an attitude copy from his brothers. "'She is a dear dolly, but why call her Pokey?' asked Rose, charmed with a new plaything. "'She is such an inquisitive little body, she is always poking that might have been nose into everything, and as Paul Pride did not suit, the boys fell to calling her Pokey.' Not a pretty name, but very expressive. It certainly was, for having examined the shells, the busy tot laid hold of everything she could find, and continued her researches, till Archie caught her sucking his carved ivory chessmen to see if they were not barley sugar. Rice paper pictures were also discovered crumbled up in her tiny pocket, and she nearly smashed Will's ostrich egg by trying to sit upon it. Here, Jim, take her away! She's worse than the puppies, and we can't have her around, commanded the elder brother, picking her up and handing her over to the little fellow, who received her with open arms and the warning remark, You better mind what you do, for I'm going to adopt Pokey like Rose did Phoebe, and then you'll have to be very good to her, you big fellows. Dopt away, baby, and I'll give you a cage to keep her in, or you won't have her long, for she is getting worse than a monkey and Archie went back to his mates, while Aunt Jessie, foreseeing a crisis, proposed that Jamie should take his dolly home, as she was borrowed, and it was time her visit ended. "'My dolly is better than yours, isn't she? "'Cause she can walk and talk and sing and dance, "'and yours can't do anything, can she?' asked Jamie with pride, as he regarded his pokey, who just then had been moved to execute a funny little jig and warble the well-known couplet, Puss tat, puss tat, where you been? I've been lunnin' to saw a tween. After which superb display, she retired, escorted by Jamie, both making a fearful din blowing on conch shells. We must tear ourselves away, Rose, because I want to get you home before sunset. Will you come for a drive, Jessie? said Dr. Alec as the music died away in the distance. No, thank you, but I see the boys want to scamper so if you don't mind, they may escort you home, but not go in. That is allowed only on holidays. The words were hardly out of Aunt Jessie's mouth when Archie said in a tone of command, Pass the words, lads. Boot and saddle and be quick about it. All right. And in a moment, not a vestige of boy remained but the litter on the floor. The cavalcade went down the hill at a pace that made Rose cling to her uncle's arm, for the fat old horse got excited by the antics of the ponies, careering all about them, and went as fast as they could pelt, with a gay dog cart rattling in front, for Archie and Charlie scorned shelties since his magnificent equipage had been set up. Ben enjoyed the fun, 
and the lads cut up capers, till Rose declared that Circus was the proper name for them after all. When they reached the house, they dismounted and stood, three on each side of the steps, in martial attitudes, while her ladyship was handed out with great elegance by Uncle Alec. Then the clan saluted, mounted at word of command, and with a wild whoop, tore down the avenue in what they considered the true Arab style. "'That was splendid. Now it is safely ended,' said Rose, skipping up the steps with her head over her shoulder to watch the dear tassels bob about. "'I shall get you a pony as soon as you are a little stronger,' said Dr. Alec, watching her with a smile. "'Oh, I couldn't ride one of those horrid, frisky little beasts. They roll their eyes and bounce about so. I should die of fright,' cried Rose, clasping her hands tragically. "'Are you a coward?' "'About horses, I am.' "'Never mind, then. Come and see my new room.' And he led the way upstairs without another word. As Rose followed, she remembered her promise to Aunt Jessie, and was sorry she had objected so decidedly. She was a great deal more sorry five minutes later, and well she might. "'Now take a good look, and tell me what you think of it,' said Dr. Alec, opening the door and letting her enter before him, while Phoebe was seen whisking down the back stairs with a dustpan. Rose walked to the middle of the room, stood still, and gazed about her with eyes that brightened as they looked, for all was changed. This chamber had been built out over the library to suit some fancy, and had been unused for years except at Christmas times, when the old house overflowed. It had three windows, one to the east that overlooked the bay, one to the south, where the horse chestnuts waved their green fans, and one to the west, toward the hills and the evening sky. A ruddy sunset burned there now, filling the room with an enchanted glow. The soft murmur of the sea was heard, and a robin chirped, Good night, among the budding trees. Rose saw and heard these things first, and felt their beauty with a child's quick instinct. Then her eye took in the altered aspect of the room, once so shrouded, still, and solitary, now so full of light and warmth and simple luxury. India matting covered the floor, with a gay rug here and there. The antique andirons shone on the wide hearth, where a cheery blaze dispelled the dampness of the long-closed room. Bamboo lounges and chairs stood about, and quaint little tables in cozy corners, one bearing a pretty basket, one a desk, and a third of several familiar-looking books. In a recess stood a narrow white bed, with a lovely Madonna hanging over it. The Japanese screen, half-folded back, showed a delicate toilet service, a blue and white, set forth on a marble slab, and nearby was a great bath pan, with Turkish towels and a sponge as big as Rose's head. Uncle must love cold water like a duck, she thought with a shiver. Then her eye went on to the tall cabinet, where a half-open door revealed a tempting array of the drawers, shelves, and cubby holes, which so delight the hearts of children. What a grand place for my new things, she thought, wondering what her uncle kept in that cedar retreat. Oh, me, what a sweet toilet table, was her next mental exclamation, as she approached this inviting spot. A round old-fashioned mirror hung over it, with a gilt eagle atop, holding in his beak the knot of blue ribbon that tied up a curtain of muslin falling on either side of the table, where appeared little ivory-handled brushes, two slender silver candlesticks, a porcelain matchbox, several pretty trays for small matters, and, most imposing of all, a plump blue silk cushion, coquettishly trimmed with lace and pink rosebuds at the corners. That curtain rather astonished Rose. In fact, the whole table did, and she was just thinking, with a sly smile, Uncle is a dandy, but I never should have guessed it when he opened the door of a large closet, saying with a careless wave of the hand, Men like plenty of room for their rattle traps. Don't you think that ought to satisfy me? Rose peeped in and gave a start, though all she saw was what one usually finds in closets, clothes and boots, boxes and bags. Ah, but you see, these clothes were small black and white frocks. 
the row of little boots that stood below, had never been on Dr. Alec's feet. The green bandbox had a gray veil straying out of it, and, yes, the bag hanging on the door was certainly her own piece bag, with a hole in one corner. She gave a quick look round the room, and understood now why it had seemed so dainty for a man, why her testament and prayer book were on the table by the bed, and what those rosebuds meant on the blue cushion. It came upon her in one delicious burst that this little paradise was all for her, and not knowing how else to express her gratitude, she caught Dr. Alec round the neck, saying impetuously, "'Oh, Uncle, you are too good to me. I'll do anything you ask me, ride wild horses, and take freezing baths, and eat bad-tasting messes, and let my clothes hang on me to show how much I thank you for this dear, sweet, lovely, darling room.' "'You like it, then? But why do you think it is yours, my last?' asked Dr. Alec as he sat down, looking well pleased, and drew his excited little niece to his knee. "'I don't think. I know it is for me. I see it in your face, and I feel as if I didn't half deserve it. And Aunt Jessie said you would spoil me, and I must not let you. I'm afraid this looks like it, and perhaps—oh, me— Perhaps I ought not to have this beautiful room after all. And Rose tried to look as if she could be heroic enough to give it up if it was best. I owe Mrs. Jessie one for that, said Dr. Alec, trying to frown, though in his secret soul he felt that she was quite right. Then he smiled that cordial smile, which was like sunshine on his brown face, as he said, This is part of the cure, Rose and I put you here that you might take my three-rate remedies in the best and easiest way. Plenty of sun, fresh air, and cold water. Also cheerful surroundings and some work, for Phoebe is to show you how to take care of this room and be your little maid, as well as your friend and teacher. Does that sound hard and disagreeable to you, dear? No, sir, very, very pleasant, and I'll do my best to be a good patient, but I really don't think anyone could be sick in this delightful room, she said with a long sigh of happiness as her eye went from one pleasant object to another. Then you like my sort of medicine better than Aunt Myra's and don't want to throw it out of the window, hey? End of chapter 6 Recording by Maria Therese